Holy Week and Easter have come and gone. Ascension Day happens in less than two weeks. Pentecost and Trinity Sunday are coming up. After that, the long period of 25 weeks or so that we call ordinary time, and which we sometimes also call the church's teaching season. <clears throat> Advent and a brand new church year starts after that, commencing a brand new cycle. To observant Christians, this is a regular and recurring aspect of our lives. The church year happens. But the secular year also happens, with its own set of events, such as family anniversaries, scheduled summer holidays, visiting friends and relatives, sometimes they stay too long, and the occasional big events, such as a family wedding or the arrival of a new grandchild. Over time, these two streams of events have become more and more separated, running, if you will, in parallel to one another. It was not always that way. If you either live in Europe or have visited the continent, especially some rural areas, you will have noticed that church bells ring out throughout the day in an apparent pattern. This pattern usually has significance and has its roots in history, and before, farm and vineyard workers had become literate. You will have noticed that the bells ring out not once, but twice, marking every hour, and several times of the day, even more elaborately. That's because workers in the fields and vineyards would first of all become aware that the bells were ringing. They would stop and wait for the second pealing of the bells, and this time they would count on their fingers how many times the bells rang. Thus they would be able to tell when it was time to stop for lunch, when it was time to go home, when it was time to pray to the Virgin in the morning, at noon, and in the evening. Those bells would also tell them when to go to bed and when to get up. On Sundays and holy days, the bells would summon them to church and were also used to inform all within hearing of both joyous occasions and sad ones, such as the loss of a villager. All this is to say that church life and secular life were very much intertwined, intimately so in a way that is not so much evident to us today. It's too easy to lose that sense of remembering the events in Christ's life and coping with our own lives are not parallel at all, but continually veer toward the centre and touch. The story of the bells show how church and labour moved together in pre-literate times. But how about literate times, even long ago literate times? The story of the Ethiopian queen's treasurer heading south in his chariot always disarms us, or disarms me at least. The vision of him being carried down a desert track, reading from the prophet Isaiah, wearing his official outfit, consisting of who knows what, Quite grand, I'm sure. The whole scene stretches the imagination, doesn't it? Running his finger along the text and trying to make something of it. Quite an unlikely picture. This man had been emasculated for a purpose and had no doubt earned his right to an education and a responsible job. He must have been in Jerusalem for important business and remember the historical connection between Judea and Abyssinia, or Ethiopia as we know it now. That connection still exists. The Ark of the Covenant was said to have been escorted to Ethiopia for safekeeping by representatives of all ten tribes of Israel. And there it is supposed to rest to this day, along with thousands of Jews who are believed to be the descendants of that escort. I have no doubt that the Queen's treasurer was as busy in his day, given his constraints, as we are now. His journey from and back to his homeland would have been long and arduous. Still, it's interesting, isn't it, 
that this important and busy man allowed the side-by-side -side lines of his work and his religious curiosity to touch. They were not parallel at all. Is it actually the case, do you think, that our daily lives are so occupied that we have forced those two lines apart so that they never touch, that the church does its thing, and we hop over the intervening gap from time to time before returning to our own path. Although it sometimes really looks that way, I think I meet the opinion that it is not that way at all, even in this frantic era in which we live. John, whose gospel sometimes stretches our ability to grasp what he is saying because of the way he says it, perhaps is offering us today a view that illustrates that these two lines will never be parallel, but always touching and reconnecting in the hearts and minds of people, sometimes unconsciously, but often with complete awareness. The metaphor of the vine has worked very well throughout history, especially in Mediterranean lands. And of course, it is a metaphor that I think we hold with a certain affection around here and everywhere where wine is understood and enjoyed. But the metaphor is meaningless without the many I am statements contained in this so-called farewell discourse of Jesus. The metaphor also loses much of its power until they learn what we who are interested in viticulture know, and that is the extraordinary amount of work the vine must do. The apparent part, those leafy trailers along those trellises, and later picturesque bunches of grapes hanging down, they are not the half of it. The real hard work goes on underground, the roots stretching, searching, going ever deeper to find moisture and nourishment. John is not talking about lovely bunches of grapes when he reports Jesus as saying, I am the vine, the true vine. He is talking about the whole enterprise, the whole process. And he is saying that it is God who is in charge. All those I am statements and there are a number of them apart from the ones we heard this morning, constitute God's promises to us that regardless of all our own enterprises, our connection to the vine that does all the work is inevitable, irreversible, and always renewable and mutual. Over and over again we hear the word abide. It is also a word of mutuality. Committed Christians worry a lot about the modern world and its problems and feel they are up against insurmountable odds. Those of us who are a bit like that need to take the word abide to heart and allow a glimmer of possibility that if God is that intimately connected with us, then God is at work in us and through us as well. Our role is to accept to respond, to allow the vitality of the vine to flow through us. It is in this way really, and only in this way, that the two parts of our lives can not only touch, but become intertwined. Amen.